Let's see metadata. So all three of these links go to the same place, and we've just formatted them three different ways. You know, if you were just working on something, it's okay to commit it, and you can just feel free to write in a summary that this isn't really important, and just go ahead and hit save page. Oh, someone else was editing the page. <laughs> That's okay. This system is designed to work with multiple people. If you think about Wikipedia, when you have the entire world being able to edit a document, someone else might edit it. What they've done is gone and shown that someone else wrote those and it shows my text. I can hit edit. I can always copy this. If I hit save, I can just be mean and say, sorry, I'm overwriting what you wrote. So if we go and look at the history, we should see that, excellent, someone else edited it. That's OK. That's great. Don't feel bad that you were editing the page. That's good. By having this kind of system, you can go in and see the changes happen. You can then merge the two together and collaborate. So if you happen to hit save on something and it, it barks at you and is grumpy, it just means that you need to do a little extra work to merge the two together. Anyone else want any other particular questions on the wiki answered now? We can keep coming back to it throughout the semester. If you start doing fancier things with the wiki page, feel free, and we can talk about it more as we go. It's just a, it's a tool for us to collaborate, and we can use it however it works best for us. Yeah? I wanted to maybe put the Google Map link in to like show where I'm from, and I didn't know if that was possible. It gave a bunch of HTTP, like if I went, I went to Maps, it went. If you want to do a Google Map, something like that. HTML, I guess, is what it showed. But. So what you can do, we just said maps.google.com. If, if that website gives you an embed link of some sort, mm -hmm. so I think if you just do link, you can link it in. I'm not sure they have an, oh yeah, here we go, embedded. So you can take an embedded link, and as long as the wiki software doesn't block us, we can just hit edit, and you can paste that in there. Hopefully the wiki won't block it. Show preview. Uh, it looks like it's probably blocking it. So sometimes they'll take stuff and either you have to fiddle with a format to, to prevent the wiki engine from changing that and interpreting it in its own way. So here it looks like it's ignored the iframe, which is some HTML tag. And so it's got this link to this page in there, which is this map. And it's, it's fiddled with it so that it doesn't work. That means that we have to go in and read the manual on how to embed actual HTML without having the, the wiki engine fiddle with it. It may take a little bit of work to figure out how to do that. Ben? If you're going to be doing a lot of stuff in the wiki, you know, using Firefox has a plugin uh, called It's All Text. It's All Text. allows you to use your local editing program, Emacs in my case, to edit the, uh, the wiki. Oh, great. So the, there's a browser plugin for it's Firefox called yeah. It's All Text that lets All you edit. Text, and, and you can specify any uh, local text editor that you particularly like. Uh, Great. Editing in here is always a little bit of a challenge. There's one big hint for the wiki page. If you write a lot of stuff in the wiki, save often. Because if you hit the back key or the browser closes and you've, say, written for an hour, that's gone. Write in something else and paste in, or save fairly often, or use It's All Text. Uh, with a text editor that you trust a little bit more than the browser. I've definitely lost some fancy edits that took some time. Megan? With putting images in or linking to images, what kind of, do you need to worry about copyright stuff? Do you need to worry about copyright on the wiki? Internally, not really. If there's something that's really restricted and someone's really, you know, it's someone you know and they might be worried about it inside, we're, we're fairly good with fair use in the academic environment. If this was an outside page and we were using it, then you would really want to worry about copyright. So if you look at Wikipedia, they're very careful about their images, that they're all fair use, open imagery. So it, it really matters what you're using it for and how, whether or not you're going to bump into the copyright law. Mm -hmm. Stuff that's used internally for a course, we've never had any trouble. Demo time. Now this is where you guys get to spell my last name, which is kind of a pain. There's a version of this in the class notes, and there's also a blog post about processing some data and making a graph. So my blog is http colon slash slash schwer, S-C-H-W-E-H-R, 
.org slash blog. And if you do .com, you're going to get some German company that does something. I don't know what they do, but not me. So I wanted to give you guys a sense of what we're getting into. Because we're going to look at a lot of commands that in and of themselves don't look like they do much. You know, when we're teaching you how to copy and move files, it kind of feels like baby steps. And you might get a little frustrated and wonder why in the world we're bothering with this. So I want to give you a really nice real world example of using the stuff we're going to be we're learning and show you that you, by combining all these things together, you get a really powerful system that lets you look at, manipulate, and, and uh, analyze data. So what I did was we have a weather station up on the roof that uh, Andy McLeod, Ben Smith, and myself have been working on. And I wanted to see what happened with Hurricane Irene. I'm going to go ahead, keep this up here, and I'm going to go start PuTTY, which is right here. And I'm logged into Research Tools. And everything I'm going to do is going to be mirrored by this. I'm just going to show you a few commands. And you're welcome to follow along. If you, if you can't, that's OK. So we've logged into Research Tools. And this device, the weather station on the roof, is actually broadcasting its data over the internal network if you connect to it. There's a couple different kinds of connections. This one is you actually have to connect up to the server and ask for the data. Other ones will broadcast out their data, and you just listen for it. This, so we want to connect to the server and listen to it. And the command is called SOCAT. It's a network cat tool that basically passes data from any port to someplace else or back and forth. And I'm going to ask it to, to go and connect up to a, what's called a TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. It's basically the language of the internet. Port on a particular computer and send that data to the console. We'll get into all the details of how this works, but it'll just keep sending it to us forever. So we only want to see the first few lines. And there's a little Unix command called head that will only grab the first 10 lines of text and then stop. Now, one thing to note here, if you've got an Android phone or an iPhone, something like that, the tools don't really play together very well. You can't take the data from one application, send it to the next one, and then pass it to a third one and ask them to all work together. Unix and Linux are exactly the opposite. They really want you to work together between tools. So we're going to take this tool called SOCAT and a tool called HEAD, stick them together, and end up taking a look at what's on the weather station. So if I go in here and paste, oh, or if I just type it, SOCAT, and I say TCP4 colon data logger 1. This is our computer that handles logging data inside of CCOM. It's on port 36,000. And we'll learn more about this stuff as we go. The dash says put it to standard out. These are all little conventions you'll learn about. So don't feel like you have to know them right now. And head. So if I do that, it went connected up to the server and showed us some data. It's all encoded. You might not know what it says, but at least we have some data. And we wanted to go in and figure out how this data works and start building some graphs of the weather station. Now this data is in a format called NEMA. There is a document on LinkedIn here, open a new window, where a guy named Eric Raymond has written extensive documentation that's open because if you want to read the actual documentation for NEMA, you've got to pay them $400 or something like that for the, the official reference. But this is good enough for most purposes. And it goes through and explains each of the messages, what type they are. And you're going to see these in your other courses. There's one called, say, uh, I think it's called GGA and GLL. These are positioning messages that come out of GPSs. And we want the weather station data coming out of our weather. And so it's putting out some GPS information because there's a GPS in the weather station. And this weather station is meant for being on a ship. So there's things like heading and uh, motion. We don't care about those. But we want to get the weather data from the weather station. So if we go back to the blog. There's a message called WMD, MDA. These are weather statements. So this is data about the weather. It's, it's encoded and it's kind of a pain. But I've got a library that will decode those. And we also want to know which ones are available. Here's a command called grep that we'll see later on that does pattern matching in text. So we can say, 
remove anything. This is me saying remove all comments from the, the file. So there's a little funny language to, to specify things like comments. Cut cuts things into pieces. I want to cut out the first statements b before the comma. So I'm going to tell it I'd like to break it apart at the comma, which is unfortunately hiding behind this extra text over here. Sort is a command that sorts things, and a dash u flag on it says unique. And we'll get into actually running these, and so you'll get a sense of how to use them and how to ask for help on these instructions. And it lists out all the NEMA strings that were found in that this file. So this is the, I've, I've got a log file, and I've gone into it, I've pulled it apart, and I've listed out all the NEMA strings that are available in that file, so I can go look them up. I then figured out that I'd like to look at this one. I went and wrote a little Python program that pulls it apart. And in Python, there's a way to split things on a comma. So here's a little example of doing that. I've written this library called NEMA DEC or NEMA decode that decodes NEMA statements. And if you add, find new statements I haven't used, you have to add them in. But I've written some Python that does that. And if you decode a little message like that, it will actually go and grab that line, parse it out, and return to you a little bit of Python that actually says what's in there. From there, I wrote a little bit of Python, and we won't go into it, that just loops through the file, finds everything that's called MDA. If it's MDA, it saves that data, and it starts building up a little uh, database of the pressure, the speed, and the timestamps. I then used a tool called IPython with this little option called PyLab, which we'll use a lot of this semester. And this is a tool that's designed for building plots. It's very much like the MATLAB plotting. In fact, it's using a plotting package called matplotlib. I then went through, processed all the data, basically made arrays of things to be able to plot. You could use some basic statistics, so I can ask it the minimum and the maximum values of the speed. So here it's in uh, meters per second. So 0 to 12.4 meters per second. You can ask it the minimum and maximum values of the pressure. I did an average of the speed. So we saw that it was 1.5 meters per second during these three days that I was playing with. And don't worry about the details here. We'll get into all of them, and you'll become pretty familiar with how to be able to use all of these pretty quickly. Here are the commands. If you've ever done MATLAB, this will look very much like MATLAB. And we'll walk through how to build plots up how to make multiple figures, how to title them, how to create special axes that are labeled by date and time. You can get really fancy. The best part is, here's the picture that came out of the program. So the, in the end, you can see Hurricane Irene coming through. There's the UTC date and time coming through here. And you're going to hear me say again and again, science data should always be in UTC. If you use local time around me for science data, I will get very upset. Because especially with ships, as you're driving all over the globe, who knows what time zone you're in. There's nothing like getting data from somewhere on the globe in some time zone, and nobody wrote down which one. So here you can see three days of data of the hurricane. The pressure on the roof started up just over one. And then as the storm came through, you can see the low come through and come pick back up. And here you can see the wind speed come along. And you can see that it was fairly consistently slow. You get some little bits of wind coming through. And you can see that the range of the speeds was pretty high. So it was very gusty when it, up here on the roof. Now we have kind of a bad location for a weather station on our roof. It's right down in the trees. But it's a, at least a great way to, to have some data to see and to get used to the same kind of sensor that's on a ship. So if you go out on a research vessel, this is exactly what you might do when you show up to a new ship. Maybe they've got a weather sensor. Maybe the data is not really terribly well available on the ship, and you want to see what's going on. You want to debug a new sensor, they place a new sensor on the roof, they put, the network, put it on the network. You can then connect up to that sensor and start making plots of the data right away. From the beginning of the idea, writing the library and making the plot, it took me two or three hours. Now, I, I've done Python for a long time, so I expect it would take longer when you're starting out, but it doesn't take forever. If I were to do this in, in uh, say, C, a programming language I use a lot, I'd still be working on it two weeks later. It's not quite as easy sometimes as MATLAB to get things right up and going, but in the long term, there's a huge amount of flexibility, and you can build plots of just about anything you want in any style that you want. We're aiming towards, 
by the end of the semester, you should be able to make plots like this all the time without too much stress and be able to use these kinds of things in your other classes. So if you start seeing uh, NEMA data from GPSs and Geodesy, then you should have no problem being able to parse that data, plot it up, and look at what a GPS was doing. If I've done my job right, dealing with things like GPSs should be no, no problem. You'll be focusing mostly on the theory of the GPS rather than the how did I parse that, that darn line coming out of the GPS. So that should give you guys a sense of what we're aiming for and some of the types of tools that we're going to do. I expect that most of what you saw going by didn't make sense. That's OK. We're going to go back and we're going to start picking up piece by piece and building up the tools that you need to be able to do stuff like this really easily. Why don't you guys bring up Putty? Just, yeah, just to warn you, my blog is full of random stuff. So it's uh, coding and other stuff. Go ahead and close that. And for today, I've done a pretty good job, I hope, of building up some basic instructions in the class website that will show you each of the steps that we're going to do on this class. We're going to do some very basic stuff with the shell, moving files around, learning how to, to get help on commands. I was hoping to do the virtual machine today so you guys could take a virtual machine with you. haven't totally finished setting it up. I need to create an account for you to log into on the virtual machine. But on Thursday, I'll show you a link that you can download a file to your laptop or to your PC at home. And any other computer that's running a VMware player tool, and you can run Linux on that computer in a window. This will give you guys the chance to play with this anywhere that you want, and it's, it'll be the exact same software that we're using in class here. So when you use this outside of class, you always have access to it, even if you're not in this classroom or if you're not on the CCOM network. So let's jump to the basic command line section. So go ahead and log in, and I want everybody to be on on the shell so that you can see what's going on and try as we go. We're going to just go ahead and create a bunch of stuff and see what's possible. In the class notes, I've got more text that talks about why are you learning Bash, uh, why do we choose Bash versus a different shell, because there's other shells. You can go through and read those. Right now, you can just take it as Bash, in my take, is the best shell to be using. <coughs> Lots of people will disagree with me, and that's OK. There's some notes on debugging and what to do if you get stuck. And I'm going to show you one thing real quick, which is the control C character is often written a couple different ways. But basically, you hold down the control key, and you press C. That's the break or like stop what I'm doing kind of command in the shell. And it's also written sometimes C or caret. The caret, some people call that the up hat, and then a C. Those all mean hold down the control key, press C. And that's the, like, I want out of here. It doesn't always work, but that's most often the other way to get out. And you can also try sometimes th just the letter Q. If you're in a program that's looking like it takes input, sometimes Q is the way to get out. We'll see that it's not the same across programs, which is a bummer. So you have to learn when you know, each of these works and why. And you'll, you'll start getting a sense of it after a while. So I'm going to walk through almost exactly what's in the notes. So feel free to have the notes up next to this. And we're going to do basically the where am I, what am I looking at uh, section. So we're underneath managing files, which will be managing files right here. So you can definitely go back through this on your own, try it all again, and see where you get. It definitely doesn't hurt to try these things a few times. So the first command I'm going to show you guys is pwd, print working directory. And this is the where am I command. And if you forget how to do these, feel free to shout out and ask or ask on the IRC channel. Just keep asking until you get comfortable with these things. So PWD is print working directory. That's where am I. So this is when you look, change locations. Like in Windows, if you're switching around folders, this is the current folder or directory that you're in. If we want to make a directory, we can do an mkdir, so make directory example. And if it doesn't complain at you, then it probably worked. And if you want to go into that directory, we can go into example with a cd. 
And we can do print working directory again. So I'll write up here the commands. mkdir make directory or folder. cd is change directory. Now, that's all great, but you had to know it was there. So how do we see what's in the, our current location? That's the ls or list command. And if it just returns to you, it can be kind of disconcerting because I typed ls and it just came back with the next prompt saying nothing. That actually means there's nothing in this directory. We mentioned it briefly before last time. There's commands take options and they typically have a dash for the option. There's a few programs that don't follow this, but this is the majority of programs. Dash A means all. So if we list all, it's hard to see, but over here there's a dot and two dots. LS is list files, and there's two special directories. There's a period, and I'm going to put a circle around that just so you see that there's a period there. That's your current directory, and it's a little weird. You might think that you don't need to know where you are right now and be able to just say this current directory, but sometimes you do need to be able to say right here. And so the period does the current directory and two periods. Put a little smiley face in there, make it really confusing. Two periods is the parent directory. In this world, it's sort of referred to as up. If you have a tree, like your home tree, then underneath that, you know, we've created example. And so we're now in example, and this is up to the home directory, which is, in this case, I think it's a slash home slash ccom and h, and then your username. Using that dash a gives you all, and the dot files are typically hidden. If you want to know more about them, you can do a long listing dash l, and that's going to give you those permission bits we talked about last time, which you'll start to get to know. The D on the left means directory. The rest of them we're going to ignore for now. This is who owns the file, so me. What group I'm in, I'm a user. And this will be the file size, which is kind of weird to think that directories have a file size, but they need to keep track of stuff on their own. And then when it was last modified, just a few minutes ago. So let's use that special directory called dot dot to go back up one out of the example directory. So cd dot dot and hit enter. And now you're back to your home directory. And the home directory in Unix and Linux is a special character called the tilde or the squiggle. I think there's a couple other names for it, but it's a, it looks like that. It's like a little wave. If you can't see below, it's a wave. That's called the tilde. And that's your home directory. Now, that's going to be different for each one of you. Everybody's got their own home directory. So when you're logged in, that tilde is your home directory. You can also say tilde and then a username. So if you want to sit, look in my directory, you can do an ls tilde and my name with an r in the end. And that will give you my home directory. So why don't you guys go ahead and take a, it's not in the notes, Take a look at my home directory. Do an ls-la tilde. You guys are going to get really good at spelling my last name. <laughs> and by the way, if you type sc and hit tab, it will complete my last name for you. So you only need to remember two or three characters in my last name. There's lots of tricks in Linux that will let you speed through things and only have to remember and type the minimum amount of stuff. Especially on the command line, you're going to be doing a lot of typing, and, the, and less typing is better. So if you do an ls-a tilde square, you're going to get all kinds of junk because I actually was working on class. And there's a few little tricks in here that actually colorize things, and I cannot read those colors. Certain files get colored special, like red. Other ones get white, and some directories get blue. So you'll, you'll start seeing these patterns, and they'll help you kind of get a sense of things. 
And if you run into stuff like this while we're in class and you really want to know, you can always ask me if I haven't mentioned it. That's the shell did that for me. LS did that without me asking. You can turn it off, but I don't remember the option to do that. One thing I did, don't have in the notes till later, you can all, always try to ask each command for help, and they often have a dash dash help option. Sometimes that's not very helpful because there's just a lot of junk. LS has lots and lots of options. So you can usually do something like LS dash dash help. That works for a lot of commands. Some of them have special options that are not that for help. But that's usually the one you can try and you'll usually get the most luck with. Now, when you're working with the shell, you oftentimes want to see stuff without actually doing anything. There's a nice command called echo that just prints to the terminal. So this is where you can try stuff and say, I want to see what you're going to do, but please don't do it. Like if you're going to delete files and you want to try out the command first to see what it might be doing, you can do it that way. So if we want to see the tilde character, we can say echo that, but we're going to say for starters, hello world. And it writes out hello world. So that's the traditional computer science first program that you write. So if you type echo hello world, you've written the traditional computer science hello world program extremely boring. Now we can say echo tilde, that home directory. If I hit enter, it's going to tell the path to my home directory and expand that tilde to wherever that points. Every single one of you will, will have a different home directory based on that. So if you want to then try different usernames, you can type that out. If we have a G. For example, if you start typing any character, it it will go and try and complete that if you hit tab. So tab is the complete character for most commands. That's the tab key on the left hand side, usually above caps lock. It doesn't always work. There isn't always something that it can figure out for you. But if you use like a tilde and the letter G is in George, you can then hit tab. It'll give you an option. If we type GA, for example, hit tab again, it then sees one unique thing and hit, you can hit enter and look in the games users. So there's actually on Linux, there's a whole bunch of usernames that come with the system that are used for operating system type background stuff. So games, uh, Linux has lots of game support if you're bored at C. And so there's a, a directory that's owned by the user games that manages game stuff. If you want to say look inside of a, of a directory from someone else, for example, you want to look at my example directory. You can say ls tilde schwer slash is the separator between directories. And in Windows, you'll see this slash, the slash that leans left. In Linux, we always use the slash that leans right, which is next to your shift key on American keyboards. So we've created this example directory. So you can say ls tilde, my last name, slash example. And you should see a directory with nothing. And if we can also come back, type echo that, and you'll see, if you type echo tilde my username slash example, you'll then see that expands out to this long path. So this is a way that you can try to see what's going on with a command. If it's acting weird, you can use this to debug what's going on. The other thing to note is if you're typing commands, you can always hit the up arrow and cycle back through your old commands. It keeps a history file. There might not be very much in yours yet, but it'll build up over time. You can use those for help. The other thing you can do is if you've been working on something for a while and you want to see the process you've been going through, there is a great command called history that's going to tell you about what's gone on in the past. Type history, it keeps a record of every command that you've typed in this session, and you can go back through that and use that as documentation. So it might be that you're figuring something out. It might take you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 tries to figure out the command that you want to use. This history of what's been going on is saved here for you, and you can use that to build up your documentation. Sometimes it's just too much when you're trying to figure something out. 
to write down every command that you're going to be using later on. And some of them you would write it down, scratch it out, write it down, scratch it out. And this way, you can go through, work on stuff, type history, and it's got a clear record of exactly what you typed. So up here you can see on line 66, that was where I tried out logging in, uh, connecting up to the weather server and listing out the weather data. It's now record if I wanted to go write some documentation on that. Let's catch up here. It depends on how it's set up. On most Linux machines, the default is to save your history whether you, even after you log out. The trouble can be is sometimes if you have two shells open, like you can log in multiple times to the same server, have two shells, and sort of split your process in mentally between the two, and only one of those gets to write to the file where it logs those. There's also ways to set the maximum number of commands that it will keep. So it may reset and lose old ones after a certain time, depending on your settings. And that's the right-click settings from the, the window bar? Now, no. since you're talking about right-click, when you're in a terminal, especially in this one with PuTTY, the mouse has nothing to do what's saved on the server. So this is a command run on the server. And if you right-click and start doing things with the PuTTY shell, you're talking about scroll back, like if you talk about saving the sessions and copying stuff to clipboard, that doesn't interact with what's going on in the shell. So that history was talking to the bash shell on the server. So if you want to save the whole session and the response that comes back, and you want to copy that from PuTTY, that's separate from what the bash shell knew. So it doesn't know what you're doing inside of the window to control the window itself. All it knows is that you've got a window that's so big, and it's got a history of things that, that it's done. So if you start fiddling with the scroll back of how much you can do with this, it doesn't know anything about that. Does that make sense? So it's typically best to sort of think like the mouse doesn't exist when you're working with this stuff. It takes a little while to get used to that, that you know, the mouse, you can use it for pasting and copying text, but after that, you should sort of let it go for a while. If you've been doing Windows for a long time, it really can take a while to get comfortable with that. Ben? Well, you're talking about history. It's nice to know that you can say you wanted to run that command number 66. You can go exclamation point 66 in order to run the command. That's a good point. We'll be doing this more down the road, is that there's all kinds of little cheats. Ben and I use live by them, because otherwise our fingers would go crazy trying to type everything that we do. There's ways to search for old commands. I can say like socat, and I can do a search. And it was in a different shell, so it doesn't remember that one. But I could say echo. So if I type echo, I can go back and I can search for them. And I'll walk you through those uh, a little bit later on. There's all kinds of ways to, to work with the shell history and the play with stuff. It's really amazing the number of things you can do. and you could learn a new thing every day for the rest of your life and you would not run out of things to learn within these shells. The estimation point and the history number is an excellent one. There's also, if you want to run the last one again, there's two exclamation points. And we'll come back through these guys throughout the semester. On each of these machines, there, there may be all kinds of disks mounted on your Linux machines. You may have attached storage like big RAID arrays or network drives, things like that. And you want to know how to know what's available on your system. It can be a little confusing. If a drive's attached, you may need to know where it is. And there's a command called df that prints out the disks that are mounted. And unfortunately, this is going to give you more information than you want. Because some of those disks aren't real. They're a part of the operating system keeping track of things it really varies by machine. So here's one, dev shm. That's some shared memory thingy that you should care nothing about. But there's a command. So we're going to use that period that seemed kind of useless before. If you say df and dot, that means give me the disk information for the disk in the, that contains this directory. So where am I right now? Right here. Tell me about the disk that I'm in. So df dot. And this tells you a little bit more interesting information about what's up. So we're looking down here. It's mounted on slash home. So that's where we are. If we do a PWD, it's, uh, you'll see a slash home in here. It's going to tell you the, the disk size. And it says one kilobyte blocks. So there, here's a lot of one kilobyte blocks. 
here's how much is used, and there's some other number that's kind of hard to understand. Here's how much is available. We have, a, as a class, have used 2% of the home disk. So that means we've got tons of space to play with in terms of what we've been doing, so we haven't really started filling it up. But is that a lot or a little? So we want to have it in a human readable form. So df dash h asks for human readable and dot. And you can now see that the sizes have changed to gigabytes and megabytes. So here we have a 22 gigabyte disk, which by today's standards is pretty small. We're trying to keep this server small. We're thinking about just using it for the class. It's not really available for processing huge blocks of data, but it's enough that we can load in test data sets and try out stuff. We've used 334 megabytes between all of us, which is by today's standard almost nothing. And we have 21 gigabytes available. I'm going to change that to an arrow and df dash h and a period. That's human readable disk space. So down the road, we're going to be mounting disks on this machine for you guys to use. And we'll be doing what's called SMB which is the Windows file share. So we'll be mounting Windows file shares onto this that you guys can work with. And you'll see those show up with a DF. So when I've said we've now mounted some drive for you with some data on it, uh, you'll use the DF command and figure out where, where the heck it got mounted onto the computer. I've showed you a bunch of commands, but I haven't taught you anything about how to go and find help on your own. And if I didn't do that, that's kind of cruel. There's a lot of information on the system. Every Linux box comes with a ton of documentation. If you're from a Windows background, it's not in a way that you would normally think of. There may be a help system, but here we're looking at a terminal. There's a couple ways that traditionally in the terminal that you've asked for help. The first one is called man, M-A-N. You may hear, if you ask for help, someone says the word to you, uh, TFM. And being that I'm recorded, I'll refer to that as read the fine manual. And you can replace the F with your favorite F word. That's not necessarily, if someone tells you RTFM, it's not necessarily mean. It's saying the documentation should be able to help you. And please read that first before you come back and ask me again. RTFM is said nicely most of the time. I've had it said to me, which is always good. So what we can do is we can take any of these commands that we've typed and we can ask for the manual on that program. So if we say man df, you're going to get some information about df. Man pages are a great resource, but they're written by all sorts of people of various writing skills and various backgrounds. They may assume more knowledge than you have. They may be incomplete. They may be horribly written by non-English speakers. That's okay. It's, it's a best attempt. It's a first starting point. And, you know, Google is always available to you too. But if you're on the terminal, especially if you're at C, this documentation goes with you at C. And if you get used to reading its style, you'll start being able to figure stuff out. You're inside of something here where it's, if you just hit enter, it's just going to go to the next line. So you're stuck inside of some program and they have a thing called a pager. And inside the pager, you can use the arrow keys, you can use enter to go to the next page, sp space to go forward. But the key thing is, if you want to quit out of that, type Q. Q for quit. And that'll get you out of the man page. I've definitely seen plenty of people who are starting out who learn man, but no one teaches them Q. And they get very, very frustrated. They end up closing their shell, and it sucks. So Q is the quit. You can hit space to go forward, the space bar. If the keyboard's set up right, you can use the arrow keys to go up and down. If you look in here, you'll see a lot of information written out, a lot friendlier than that dash dash help. Goes through and talks about the options. If you're lucky, sometimes they'll have examples in there. Not always. They'll also have see also, other programs that might be related to that that you might be interested in. The author, who you can blame for this software. These nice people wrote it how to report bugs if there's problems with the software. The reason that Linux is so good is that everybody contributes back. So even if you're not a programmer, you can still contribute back to these projects. You can send them toll information if there's a misspelling or if you want to have some text that you think you should add to this man page. 
email these people, and they might actually take, take your text and stick it in. So now I've quit out of that, and I want to find the man information about something that I'm not sure about what it is. So you might not necessarily know what you're looking for exactly. Maybe we want to sort something, and we want to find out about sorting. You can do man, and there's an option called dash k, which is also written out apropos, which is a little bit harder to type. And we can say then sort. Sort. So if we do man dash k sort, that's going to search all of the man pages, the one line description that's at the top of each one, for the word sort. So you might get back some funny things that you don't expect, but it might also get you the, the command that you need to learn. So here we asked for sort, and we got back a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know or care about. But that sort command that we just used earlier in the example is in there, so you can then realize that there's man sort is available. There are some funny numbers after this, the three and the one commands. Manuals with one after them are command line programs that you can run. Things with two and three are for C programming. And you probably in this course aren't going to be interested in anything with a two or a three after it. It is not going to help you very much. Man pages with one after them mean that it's a, a program that you can actually run. And those are the man pages that you're going to be interested in. We have a few more minutes, so let's do a few more Unix commands that let you work with files and start playing with things. There's really great tools inside of the command line to let you work with large numbers of files. If you have a thousand log files that you're working with from some instrument, it's okay. It, it can be overwhelming at first, but there's really great ways to help you slice out pieces of what you might want. Like if you want to grab just one month of data, if the files are named well, it can be actually fairly easy. So we're going to go into a section on the class called pattern matching. So specifying groups of files, pattern matching. So I'm in my home directory, and if you ever want to get back to your home directory, just type cd and hit enter, and you go home. You could also do cd tilde, and it'll get you to the same spot. In here, let's go ahead and create a couple files. And I showed you the touch command last time, so we'll touch. And before we just did one file, you can actually do any number of files. Touch, one, two, three, and we'll hit enter. So now if we do a long listing, you see the files one, two, and three. And they're all, being this is touch, they're all zero length, so we're just playing with them. It doesn't matter what's in them. We can then RM them. When we're done, if we're annoyed, we don't want them anymore. Poof, they're gone. Uh, the scary thing about that is that it doesn't ask you. And so you can, with one command, delete your entire directory and all the children underneath it and everything you've been working on for the last 10 months. And that's why I have backups. Later on, I'll, be, I'll show you how to set this up so that it's permanent, but you can always add a dash i. So we'll do the touch command again. So I'm going to hit Go up in the history with the arrow keys till I see the touch again. Do the touch. If we do rm dash i, one, two, and three, and rm, prompt before, yes. Touch, one, two, three. Okay, rm dash i, one, two, three. There we go. I did the touch to create the three files. I did the long listing to see if they're there, and there's one, two, and three. And then I did the RM again, but with a dash I in there. And it now says for each file, remove regular, and it actually looked and said, hey, it's empty. Uh, remove this file one, and then you can type Y or N for yes or no. So I can say yes to this one. Oh wait, I really don't want to get rid of that file. No to number two, and yes for number three. Later on, we'll actually go and create an alias so that it always asks you and you have to turn off that feature so that you don't accidentally go and delete everything really quickly because it is a great way to lose work. All of us have been doing this for a long time. Invariably, you will do this by accident. You will delete stuff you did not want to delete. And you'll have to go to the backups and go get it. So now if we create a whole bunch more files, let's touch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is when you get annoyed about typing. But let's also create 100. And maybe we'll throw on an 11, 12, and 13. 
you have a lot of files now, and you have a really exciting project going on with no data in it. So it's good. It's definitely good for a chuckle, but touch is a great way to play with stuff and to learn how to work with files without having to use real data. So now we're going to use some of that pattern matching. So we're going to start off with the star. And the star means match any text. ls star is very much like just running the ls command. It says ls and any file. I want to list any file. Be very, very careful. This is a very bad idea. rm and star will delete things very quickly. And Linux is very efficient. So they will delete before you can hit control or close a window, they'll be gone. So star is, is the match anything. This is anything. We can match anything except for it's going to go and match our directories and then it's going to go look in the directories and get really annoying. So what we can do is start saying, let's match anything that starts with a one. So if we look at our list of things that we've created, there's a fair number of files that start with one. So we can say ls1 star outcome the 1, 10, 100, 11, 12, 13. You could also say what ends in a zero. So anything that ends in zero. So you do a star, ls star, and then zero. And that'll give you the 10 and the 100 ended in a zero. So you, if you think about files that are named with the dates, like I say it had year, dash, month, dash, day, you could ask for all the things that were in 2011 or everything that was in August, or everything that was the first day of every month. So you can start building up these pattern matches that say, I want to grab every file that's the first day of the month and just use those. You can also start wrapping that completely around. So we can say, what starts with a 1 and ends with a 0? Anyone want to take a guess at what's going to start with a 1 and end with a 0? How many files are we going to get back? Well, it was one way to find out. Boom. Two. Same thing as we just got before. But if you also said what starts with a 1 and ends with a 3, will that get the 13 or will it not? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, because anything also means nothing. So if that star doesn't match anything, if you could take the 1 and the 3 and stick them together, that, that's a good match. So star is, is a really nice character for finding all sorts of stuff. You can say ls. Now we have what's called a tape archive. I have one of those in my folder. I can say, show me all of the tape archives, or TARs. So I can say ls star dot tar. And there's one that came back. If I had a bunch of text files that end in dot txt, I could say ls star dot txt. And I don't have any. But if there were, you could then list all of those. So it's really handy. If people are using the extensions, to the normal convention, like if there were XML files and they were all named .xml, you could list star.xml. There's another match that's especially helpful that we'll end up using a fair bit, and that's the question mark, and that matches any character. It's a single character of any type. So question is any one character. So what are we going to get back if we just do an ls and a question mark? We're asking the great question. It's every file that has one character in its name. If we do two question marks, it's every file that has a name that's two characters. Now I'm going to show you, especially since I've got some directories and you have an example directory, if you do dash D on ls, it's going to not look into directories because it gets really annoying very quickly. So if we do ls dash D, anything with two characters, I have this little weather folder, WX, that I was working with on that blog post. And I don't want to go look in there every time I was doing that. And then if we also add the dash L, we get a long listing. And you can see that we have a couple of empty files and our weather directory. So you can start combining that to say, I want all files that are two characters long, but I want to start with a one. So that's great. Or I want it to end in a three. So you can start building up these queries that match bits and pieces of the data. So if you log things smartly, you can then start pulling it apart pretty effectively. You can also do ranges of files. So if we want to list 2 through 5, we can put a square bracket and say 2-5. 
and I've now listed two, three, four, five. Things like date ranges, log files by day, start becoming very easy to work with if you name them with numbered days. So that's the square brackets are a range of number dash number. That also works with characters. You can say anything starting with A through J, A dash J. I don't let's see if I've got anything here. Let's make an example here real quick. So if we do an ls dash ld, uh, how about m through z? Anything that starts with an m through z. And we get back that this nemadec.tar and this wx directory, those two things match that pattern. Now these patterns, when you start off, they, they're not very interesting. It's sort of hard to imagine sometimes how to put them together, but we'll start combining them in all sorts of ways and eventually you'll just start using them without thinking about it and you'll start saying well I've got a bunch of files let's grab this batch and we'll take that batch from here and piece things together so we're building up a big jigsaw puzzle and when you're looking at the one couple little pieces they don't look like much until you start putting them together let's do something really quick and then we'll uh, end for today if we want to go look in the system directories there's a place for binaries if we say which df it's in bin, or the other command is type df. That command is in the, the slash bin directory. If we want to go look in there and say what, what starts with z, we can say ls slash bin slash z star, and it will tell us all the files in the bin directory that start with the letter z. And there's a couple. So if you're looking for something, it can really help you start to understand what's where and help you search through this computer, which is full of all sorts of tools that you'll, you'll be learning many of. So next time, we're going to go ahead and get a virtual machine onto all of your computers so you can run Linux not on this server, which is actually sitting upstairs and over in the new wing. You'll be running Linux in a window on your computers, and you can copy that file onto a USB drive, take it with you, and use it on any computer that has a VMware player. So these are tools that, as you learn them, they can go with you pretty much anywhere. Hopefully, you guys, your brains haven't gotten too saturated from this. We're going to go back and we're going to use these commands throughout the semester and expect that it just takes a lot of repetition to get comfortable with them and to learn which ones you want to remember. Some of these commands, you don't have to know them all. You just need to know enough that you can get done what you need to get done. That was a lot of material for one day for a beginning command line, so hopefully Keep with it, and we'll, uh, we'll keep going through it. We're going to jump into that virtual machine, and it should be uh, processing some data very soon. And I'll stick around for a little bit if you have any questions or want to talk about any of the stuff that we've gone over so far. Uh, Matt, you've discovered the underscore in the uh, IRC names. Yeah. Each time I log in, I get another underscore. Yeah, if you have multiple logins to the, uh, the IRC channel, it won't have multiple people logged in with the same name. So you can have yourself logged in for multiple ones, and the tool will just see that you're already in there with that name and create a new name. It, it just depends on which program you're using, what character they add to it. Don't be surprised when that happens.